the American Wild West, known for dramatic stories of cowboys and outlaws. But hidden beneath this sprawling wilderness lies a lost prehistoric world. Tens of millions of years ago, the West was truly wild. It was tropical and humid, lush, green vegetation, towering trees, and the distance, a vast sea. This was the stomping ground of the most gigantic creatures ever to walk the Earth, the dinosaurs. As the dinosaurs became extinct 65 million years ago, their bones were buried and their very existence remained hidden. But 200 years ago, all that started to change as explorers flocked to this area looking for fossils. And in doing so, they ensured that the Wild West would be at the heart of a ruthless dinosaur gold rush. Now I'm on the hunt for the astonishing story of those cutthroat discoveries. The fossil collectors would spy on each other. They hated each other vehemently. Wow. I'll be uncovering incredible details about the world's most iconic creatures. I'm going to put that in your hands very carefully. Oh, that's so cool. And revealing the very first discoveries of some of the most amazing dinosaurs of all time. Triceratops, T-Rex, and the most famous of them all, Dippy, the Diplodocus. This is the incredible story of the greatest dinosaur discoveries and how the Jurassic world really came to life. The Natural History Museum, London. Home to one of the greatest dinosaur collections in the world and a very special exhibit. The creature that started a worldwide dinosaur craze. And here it is, the most famous dinosaur of them all, Dippy. Our own prehistoric national treasure. Dippy has been wowing visitors to this museum for over 100 years, since 1905. And for millions of them, it was the first dinosaur they would ever have seen. Can you imagine how exciting that must have been? Actually, I can imagine that, because I think it was the first dinosaur I saw when I was brought here as a young child. And even many years later, I still get such a thrill being up close to this gigantic dinosaur. Dippy is a diplodocus a huge plant-eating animal and one of the largest to ever walk the earth. It would have weighed a whopping 12 tonnes, as much as three elephants, and lived between 70 and 80 years. When it died, this prehistoric giant's bones were buried beneath the ground for 150 million years, until 1899, when they were uncovered in Wyoming, America. What makes Dippy so special is that it was remarkably complete. And the bones were so well preserved that they could piece together this skeleton and be confident about its accuracy. But the incredible discovery of Dippy was actually the end of a very long and cutthroat journey. One that involved amazing dinosaur finds but is filled with bitter rivalries and bewildering twists and turns. And it all started over 40 years earlier with a chance event on the east coast of America. In 1858, a Philadelphia lawyer, William Folk, was visiting the home of a neighbor near some woods in Haddonfield, New Jersey. To his complete surprise, he spotted bizarre objects around the house as decorations and doorstops. They were like nothing he'd really ever seen before, but they looked like big chunks of bone. He demanded to be taken to the place where they'd been found. The location was a forest only a few miles away. The soil there was marl, a fine clay, very good at preserving old bones. He wondered if there could be more bones there put together a team of people and they started stripping off the soil layer by layer. First, they found nothing. 
they kept going, and slowly, objects start to appear out of the ground. Small bones, big bones. Falk knew that he could potentially have something remarkable in his hands here. Today, the mysterious fossils he dug up are held in Philadelphia at the Drexel University Academy of Natural Sciences, the oldest natural history museum in the United States. Dr. Ted Deschler is a curator here. Come on in. Oh, the collection. You know it. So, this is the cabinet where those original bones that folk collected in Haddonfield, New Jersey are. Whoa, so, that's huge. I know. This is the upper arm bone. This is the humerus, the original piece. So I'm going to put that in your hands very Whoa, carefully. OK. That's so cool. So this is the end up in the shoulder. This is the end down at the elbow. Wow. That's about as long as your entire arm. Yeah, so it's about twice the size of me. These are the lower limb bones, a wow. tibia and a femur. These How many are bones are there in all? I think there's about 35 bones, which is not a complete skeleton. No, there's a lot missing. There's a lot missing. Paleontology wasn't established yet, so folk needed help identifying the bones. Luckily, there was an expert nearby, an anatomist called Joseph Lydie. He investigated every bone found. When he got to the teeth, he realized something incredible. They were very similar to those of an iguanodon, a dinosaur found three decades earlier in Britain. So those teeth, that's critical evidence that this is, well, this is a dinosaur. Yes, it, it compared exactly to what was previously known of dinosaurs, but it was different as well. So it's it not an iguanodon. It's not an iguanodon. This was the very first dinosaur found in America. Lydie named it Hadrosaurus, meaning bulky lizard, Fokii, after William Folk. This is worked out as a dinosaur, far more complete than anything in old England. This must have been, this is groundbreaking. Absolutely. It was a revolution. It was the beginning of understanding dinosaurs. It's so amazing to think that this astonishing discovery could have just remained unnoticed. But now that it had been discovered and it had been brought here, the question is, what did this animal look like? Lydie started trying to put it together, but he only had 30% of its bones. This was a marriage of science and imagination. It took 10 long years to complete it. Here are some great images of that original attempt to rebuild the dinosaur. You've got to remember that Lydie didn't know what he was aiming for. He didn't know what this dinosaur would actually look like. But he did understand the anatomy of animals in the world around him. And he looked at these bones and he thought there was something similar to the kangaroo going on. So you can see that he's placed this skeleton in an upright stance, strong hind legs, arms sticking out, a bit like a kangaroo. The head, which he had very little evidence for at all, well, he just got this made up based on the iguana's head. It was the first time anyone had tried to reconstruct a dinosaur using its actual bones. In 1868, the incredible find went on display in Philadelphia, and it captivated audiences. Though it wasn't entirely accurate, this is what we now know the Hadrosaurus looked like, walking on four legs, not two. As a large plant-eating animal, it would have spent the entire day eating greens to feed its massive three-ton bulk. But the discovery was remarkable, and it kicked off an exciting gold rush to uncover the secrets of the lost world of the dinosaurs. Fossil hunters now descended on the mile pits of New Jersey, desperate to get their hands on some dinosaurs. Sadly, most went away empty-handed. But, as luck would have it, tantalizing clues were being discovered elsewhere in America. In the 
1860s, the US government began building a train line thousands of miles across the Western territories. As the workers dug, they found something astonishing, bones all along the tracks. I'm heading into the Wild West, following in the footsteps of those early dinosaur hunters. Majesty, a real beauty to this wide, flat landscape. Big sky country. It's pretty dry, pretty arid, doesn't look great for agriculture. In fact, the Native Americans that lived in this area used to call it Mako Sika, the Badlands. In 1868, a Yale University professor called Othniel Charles Marsh took the train on a trip west. While his fellow passengers were on the train heading west, seeking a new life and opportunities, he was there for a rather different reason. He was a trained geologist and anatomist, and he was looking for fossils. The bones that had been discovered by the railway workers weren't American animals. They belonged to ancient elephants and tigers. To Marsh, they were incredible discoveries. The fact that there were no longer elephants or tigers present in North America made him think that, well, if that much had changed, then surely anything was possible. Perhaps once these lands had been roamed by dinosaurs. It may have seemed like a long shot, but if his hunch was right, he could be about to discover the remains of dinosaurs. I'm heading deep into America's Wild West on the trail of the first dinosaur hunters and their battle to unearth the secrets of these prehistoric creatures. To get a feel of what they're up against, I'm joining a modern day dinosaur excavation in Utah. Paleontologist John Foster has directed digs in the old Wild West for many years. John, this is not a bad commute every day. No, it's, it's a good view. It's a little steep, but that makes it interesting. What are we digging out behind us now? We have a sauropod pelvis, and we don't yet know what kind of sauropod it is. So sauropod, a, a giant uh, plant-eating dinosaur, like Dippy, like the Diplodocus. Exactly, yes. In fact, this could be a Diplodocus, we don't know yet. We need to get a better look at some of the vertebrae from the back to tell for sure. The first dinosaur hunter to come out west was Othniel Charles Marsh, way back in 1868. John, tell me, Marsh, the trained geologist, what's he seeing in this landscape? Is it giving him hope? What we're looking at here is a sandstone, a pretty fine sandstone, and there is some siltstone and mudstone mixed in that represent a river channel that was flowing at the time. He would have recognized these types of rocks as being the kind of that you wanted to look at to find animals. With evidence for exotic animals and soil conditions that seem to favor the preservation of fossils, Othniel Charles March was convinced that he'd found good hunting grounds for dinosaur bones. Can you imagine his excitement? Rather than travel the world, he can now just hop on a train and find himself in rich hunting grounds like this. But Marsh was not the only one to be tantalized by the Wild West. A young explorer Edward Drinker Cope had also been captivated, and he was just as driven. Cope and Marsh first met in 1864. Initially, they were friendly. 
And then something happened that ruined their friendship. Cope received a set of intriguing vertebrae found in Kansas and tried to put the mysterious animal together as accurately as possible. This is what Cope came up with. It's a strange looking creature, impossibly long tail, very short neck. But he thought, you know what, they're strange looking creatures anyway. Marsh then came out publicly against him and ridiculed his build. He pointed out the head was on the wrong end of the body. This was really embarrassing. Today, we know the animal as the plesiosaur Elasmosaurus. It lived around 80 million years ago and weighed just over two tons. It was about 34 feet in length, but 23 feet of that was just the neck. It's one of the longest necked creatures to have ever lived. Plesiosaurs were not dinosaurs, despite living at the same time as them, but marine reptiles. Their legs spread out at the sides like a modern lizard or crocodile, unlike dinosaurs whose legs were positioned under their bodies. The Elasmosaurus incident sparked a rivalry between Marsh and Cope. Both men now set about trying to discover as many dinosaur remains as they could. But they had a huge challenge ahead of them. The lands they wanted to investigate were centered in Wyoming and Colorado, with other promising hotspots in nearby states. Nowadays, this is called the Morrison Formation and covers a whopping 600,000 square miles. In 1870, two years after his first train journey, Marsh organized a trip into the vast wilderness of the Morrison Formation. His biggest concern was safety. American westward expansion meant encroaching on Native American land. It's a very troubled history. As the American settlers moved west, they clashed with Native Americans who'd inhabited that territory for centuries, like the Lakota. Marsh was not alone. He was accompanied by a group of wealthy Yale students to help him hunt for dinosaurs, all ready for the rough ride. And to be safe on their dangerous journey ahead, they hired military escorts from the many forts built across the Wild West. The plan was to scout either side of the Union Pacific Railroad and do some shallow digging, check if there's any potential for dinosaur fossils. They were going to comb over a gigantic chunk of territory, and they were going in blind. Nowadays, it's hard to imagine what that journey into the unknown wilderness, hunting for prehistoric creatures, would have been like 150 years ago. But I want to get a taste of it. Got my hat, backpack full of water. I'm off. Off into the dry lands that promised dinosaur bones. It's a gorgeous landscape. I love these undulating plains that stretch off as far as the eye can see. There's no big trees, no shade anywhere. The sun is unforgiving. After only a few hours, it's tough going. Well, I'm definitely burning already, even though I'm covered in sun cream. Back in 1870, they didn't have any of that. It just really makes you think about those early explorers like Marsh moving across his landscapes, 40 degrees centigrade today. No water in sight. I'm wilting, and it's my first day. They did it for months on end. 
Plus, I haven't seen these snakes yet, which is good, because I hate snakes. One day, after 14 hours of trekking, one of Marsh's soldiers exclaimed, what did God Almighty make such a country as this for? Marsh and his team started scouting and digging in June 1870 and worked all through summer and into autumn. They moved across Western America, ending up in Kansas. By November, they were exhausted. Months of trekking and camping had seriously affected their health. They had found lots of fossils, but all of them were mammal fossils from after the extinction of the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. Marsh wanted evidence of dinosaurs. As autumn was turning into winter, Marsh and his team were getting ready to leave Kansas and head home. But he had one last lead. Cope's head in the wrong place. Elasmosaurus had come from Kansas, and Marsh was hoping he could find one in Kansas too, preferably one a lot bigger than Cope's. On the last day of the expedition, for some reason, Marsh just didn't want to go back to the camp. And I have his account here. He went ahead with just one soldier for protection, and that soldier started to get very jumpy. He writes here that it was after sunset, but he was still working his way along the riverbank. Suddenly, Something stopped him in his tracks. He spotted a mysterious object sticking out of the ground. It could have been a rock, but to Marsh's trained eye, it looked like a bone. At long last, Marsh had discovered something. I brought with me an exact replica of what he found that day. I must say, I'm not sure I would have spotted it on the riverbank, but he certainly did have a trained eye. It looks very bird-like, but you can see this piece at the end suggests it was a different animal entirely. He needed to find out what animal it belonged to, and that was no easy task. Marsh spent week after week going through the world's scientific literature. After about a month, that hard work paid off. He discovered that bones had been found in Bavaria, Germany, that bore a strong resemblance to the bone that he had discovered. So, to his great surprise and satisfaction, it became clear that he had discovered part of a pterodactyl, a flying reptile that lived 100 million years ago during the age of the dinosaurs. Amazingly, this was the first pterodactyl bone to be discovered in America. Others had been found in Europe, but they were nowhere near as big. Pterodactyls, carnivores, great hunters who fed mainly on small animals. They had huge leathery wings, long and large necks and heads, and they are still the largest known flying animals. The bone Marsh discovered in Kansas was from the pterodactyl's wing. From that small fragment of bone, Marsh was able to calculate the wingspan of the pterodactyl, which was an impressive 20 feet. It was truly a gigantic dragon, he wrote, even this country of big things. It was such an exciting moment. Here, finally, was the proof that there were the bones of dinosaur age animals out here in the West. But Marsh wasn't the only one hunting for dinosaurs in this vast wilderness. Edward Drinker Cope was also combing through the badlands of Western America. Tracked across western Kansas, searching the same terrain in which Marsh found his pterodactyl. He scoured the banks of rivers, creek beds, cliffs, ravines. And he found fossils, but they were of giant fish or sea turtles. No sign of a dinosaur. But true to form, he kept going. Finally, he found something, a big bone. Amazingly, it belonged to an even bigger pterodactyl with a wingspan of 25 feet. The Wild West was at last beginning to give up its prehistoric remains. And an extraordinary new discovery 
was just around the corner. 150 years ago, the wild American West became a hunting ground for dinosaur bones. Amazing new discoveries of flying pterodactyls and underwater giants had already been made. But the hunt was very much on for more discoveries and for bigger and better preserved dinosaurs. By 1877, the search was reaching boiling point. One afternoon that spring, a school teacher from Colorado called Arthur Lakes was exploring the Rocky Mountains with his friend. They were walking along a creek when he spotted what looked like a strange old tree trunk. He took a closer look and it appeared to be, to his untrained eye, a bone. Paleontologist John Foster is showing me what Lakes would have seen all those years ago. Well, here it is. Wow. At first, it looks like a bit of rock, doesn't it? It does. It's very similar in color to the rock, but it's got a totally different texture. Yeah. Um, and you can really see the shape pretty well, at least on this end. And is that a leg bone? Yeah, it's a thigh bone, so a femur. This is actually the color that the bone is after it's been exposed to the sunlight for a while. This kind of bluish gray color is very typical of bone in most settings once it's been out on the surface. Presumably, Lakes wasn't a paleontologist, right? So he didn't, he didn't know what that was. He recognized that it was some type of very large ancient animal, but he didn't know exactly what kind. Lakes needed an expert opinion, so he wrote separately to the two men who started the hunt for dinosaurs, Marsh and Cope. Marsh responded first and sent an agent to the site. I've got a letter here from Marsh's man on the spot, his agent. He writes to Marsh and he says, satisfactory arrangements made for two months, meaning he'd secured exclusive access to this site for the next two months. Then he says, Jones cannot interfere. Jones is their code name for Cope. So somehow they managed to exclude Cope from looking into the same fossils. So all that's left now is to check whether the site is worth all the fuss. Marsh's men started digging. Over the next few months, they carefully and painstakingly removed layer after layer of soil. Then they spotted something. There it was, by that same creek that Lakes had discovered his first fossil, it was a bone. And incredibly, another bone and another one. It turned out that Lakes, the school teacher, the amateur, had stumbled across a gold mine of monster skeletons. A whole prehistoric world was starting to emerge. I'm heading to the Carnegie Museum of Natural History to find out the outcome of the dig. When Marsh got the finds back to his lab, he spent months studying them. And as his work progressed, he realized he had something very, very special in his hands, something unlike anything ever found anywhere in the world. He had indeed found new species of dinosaurs. Now you can imagine the excitement of a man who'd spent years and years preparing for this moment. Paleontologist Matt Lamana can show me some of the dinosaurs that were miraculously discovered by Marsh's team in Colorado. The site turned out to be a treasure trove. This is Stegosaurus. This animal lived about 150 million years ago. Its fossils have been found here in North America, in particular Western North America. Also, if we paleontologists have this right, also in Portugal. So it makes it one of the very few intercontinental dinosaurs or modern intercontinental dinosaurs that we know about. One of the things that intrigues me the most about Stegosaurus and its family is that this is one of the only major groups of dinosaurs to have gone extinct before the giant asteroid fell out of the sky. Maybe because they were carrying around so much uh, <laughs> armor. What, what are these, what are the spikes? Yeah, yes. 
When the animal was first discovered back in the late 19th century, Marsh actually interpreted the plates as lying flat. And so the name Stegosaurus actually means covered lizard because he thought it was covered in these plates. Their function remains controversial to this day. I think the, the consensus opinion is that they probably were for display to other Stegosaurus, maybe also warding off predators by making the animal look bigger. But there also probably was a thermoregulatory function. In other words, a function uh, that plates may have played a role in keeping the animal warm or cool. Wow. So if you still aren't even sure today, can you imagine Marsh and his colleagues, they would have just been taking wild guesses. Yeah, I think absolutely. And remember, too, that in the early days of paleontology, for the most part, they're working with much less complete skeletons than we have today. Marsh's team also discovered clues of the most famous killer dinosaur. Well, I know what this one is. It's the T-Rex. Yep, Tyrannosaurus Rex. This thing lived between about 68 to 66 million years ago in the western part of this continent, North America. It would have absolutely been the apex predator in its environment. The only thing I think that an adult T-Rex would have to fear would be another adult T-Rex. And look at those teeth and those jaws. Rather than taking bites out of prey, this animal seems to have been adapted for grabbing prey and crushing it. So this would have been a very formidable animal to encounter. You know, Jurassic Park sometimes exaggerates attributes of its dinosaurs, but there's no need to exaggerate this one. This was perhaps the most formidable land carnivore that's ever existed. So Marsh's team found the first T-Rex. In, in a sense, yeah. Marsh's collector, Arthur Lakes, found teeth in Colorado that we now know belong to this dinosaur. But it took the discovery of this skeleton um, beginning in 1902 in Montana by Barnum Brown to really start to reveal what this animal was really like. So this is the original Tyrannosaurus Rex? Yeah, yeah. This is when the name T-Rex was coined. It became the gold standard for the most formidable predatory dinosaur that's ever lived. Marsh had spent almost a decade scouring the Western Territories for dinosaur bones. Now, at long last, it was a bonanza. But figuring out exactly what he had proved to be a bigger challenge than he had anticipated. So when I was a kid, I loved the Triceratops. Yeah, I, I love them too, actually. So this dinosaur is probably the biggest of the horned dinosaurs. And it lived from about 68 to 66 million years ago in Western North America. So alongside T-Rex. Alongside T-Rex, yeah. So this animal would have encountered T-Rex, would have been hunted by T-Rex, and would have violently defended itself from T-Rex. In fact, alongside T-Rex, this is one of the very few dinosaur species that people would be familiar with that would have actually been wiped out by that giant asteroid impact at the end of the Cretaceous. We know that Triceratops survived to witness that event. Wow. The name Triceratops means three-horned face. I think you can see why. You know, two horns over the eyes, one horn on the nose. And then, of course, this giant neck frill, this giant solid sheet of bone extending off the back of the skull. And was it Marsh's team who identified Triceratops? Yeah. So Marsh actually was, I believe, sent a pair of horn cores, so the horns over the eyes. He actually thought it was a weird type of bison. And only a few years later, when more complete skulls of this animal started turning up, it became clear this was a type of, of giant horned dinosaur. In those early days, it must have been so easy to get it wrong. Yeah, I mean, remember that Cope and Marsh are dealing with, a lot of times dealing with, with pretty incomplete fossils, and they're racing to outdo each other. In fact, uh, Cope and Marsh collectively named what we now know to be the same species of mammal over 20 times. <laughs> The amazing finds by Marsh's team in Colorado sealed his name as one of the greatest, if not the greatest, of American paleontologists. But Cope was still on the hunt. Cope was growing frustrated. And that same year, 1877, he decided to follow Marsh to Colorado. He pitched his tent nearby. Can you imagine how annoying that must have been? And then he started digging. Marsh was digging in Morrison, Colorado. Cope set up camp only 100 miles to the south in Canyon City. Soon, he too started to find bones. He hit the jackpot, and it was a big jackpot, literally. Canyon City turned out to be full 
of dinosaur bones. Cope found a Camarasaurus, like this one here, and it was the biggest dinosaur ever found at that point in history. The Camarasaurus was a huge plant-eating animal that lived 150 million years ago, during the Jurassic Age. The largest of the species would have weighed close to 52 tons. Just one tooth would have been seven and a half inches long. Despite these amazing finds, throughout the summer of 1877, the digging reached fever pitch. But just around the corner, an unexpected opportunity was about to take the dinosaur hunt to a whole new level. In August of 1877, Marsh received a mysterious letter from two gentlemen in Wyoming. It's cagey, it's tantalizing. They wanted to interest him in a little business deal. They told him that they'd found a large number of fossils, in particular, a big one, possibly bigger than anything found in Colorado. They say here, as you're well known as an enthusiastic geologist and a man of means, both of which we're desirous of finding, more especially the latter. They're saying, let's see how rich you are. Now, this was very interesting for Marsh. It seemed like there might be a new, rich seam of fossils out in Wyoming. The big thing was to get there first. Was it possible there was a whole new dinosaur gold mine waiting to be discovered? Marsh was about to find out. <laughs> 150 years ago, there was a battle going on in the American Wild West to discover new species of dinosaurs. In the burning summer of 1877, one man was chasing an exciting new lead. Marsh had received a tantalizing letter from Como Bluff in southeastern Wyoming, so I'm heading there now. Como Bluff is around 200 miles north of the very rich fossil fields of Colorado, but the letter promised much bigger and better fossils. So Marsh was determined to check if it was true. I'm going to get an expert introduction to this amazing site with paleontologist Melissa Connolly. Hey, how's it going? Hey, welcome. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Welcome to Jurassic Park, huh? <laughs> what a great landscape. <laughs> yeah, isn't it beautiful here? Yeah. Melissa has been digging in Como Bluff for almost 30 years and knows all the hidden spots where the rocks tell stories from millions of years ago. What's going on down here? Well, this is this is the star of the show. These are dinosaur footprints. You've got to be kidding me. No, check These out. enormous holes in the ground. Yeah, yeah, these are sauropod tracks. So this is a big footprint right here. This whole hole right here is just one footprint. And it is the hind foot of a sauropod where he just stepped down in to the mud and he was so heavy, he pushed right through that muddy layer into the soft sediments below. And the impact, pushed up this ridge here, this, this rim, which we call the impact rim. And then what, a, a flood came and put down a layer of sediment and then they were preserved forever? Exactly, and then the water rose and the muds came in and filled in all these little holes and preserved it forever. Is, it, is that one there and, and is that something there as well? Exactly, so we have the sauropod walking along and we have other sauropods walking along, different sizes, and then we have theropods walking as well. So there's lots of little theropods running along, along there looking for something to eat, I'm sure. This is evidence of dinosaurs, not dead, but alive. Exactly, they're living. This is behavior, fossilized dinosaur behavior. The footprints here reveal a lost world, locked in a moment. It was filled with meat-eating dinosaurs known as theropods, the great hunters of the prehistoric age. And huge plant-eating animals known as sauropods. Now listen, I don't want to get too dramatic here, but this could have been Dippy. It could have been Dippy, yes. Oh my goodness. This could have been Dippy, yes. <laughs> These many tracks in the soil show just how incredible Como Bluff is at preserving traces of the prehistoric past. But in 1877, no one had a clue. 
until one man arrived at the scene and found something even more intriguing. William Reed was a railroad man. He was based at the local station of Como, now since gone. One day in March of that year, he was hiking back to the station when he noticed some huge bones sticking out of the landscape. He took a closer look and they were big bones. It was a shoulder blade that was about a meter and a half in length and there was a piece of vertebra which seemed to be about three quarters of a meter in circumference. Now he had no idea what to do with this, but he had heard news that a fancy East Coast professor was paying money for finds like this. So he decided to write him a letter. The letter arrived on Marsh's desk in August 1877. He immediately mobilized his team, sending them straight to Wyoming to see if Reed was onto something. They put an embargo on the location and started digging. Nowadays, it's hard to visualize what they would have found when they got here because so much has been removed. But Melissa can give me a taste of it. She wants to take me to the oldest active quarry in Como Bluff. Hi, everyone. Hello there. Hello. Hello. How are you doing? Glenn, you are working on a pile of bones there. I am. Tell me, what, what is going on here? This is a what I call kind of a jackpot find. You have a femur from what looks like a very large sauropod, a femur from another large sauropod, and the real surprise bone, which is a stegosaurus tail spike. These are a, at least a couple of different animals just all piled on top of each other. Yes, and that's not uncommon here either. We've discovered as many as 20 different species at this quarry over the 32 years that it's been uh, operating. As we're sitting here, dinosaurs are emerging from this site. Yep, absolutely. And these are all Jurassic Age. Como Bluff seems to be a dinosaur gold mine. This is ridiculous. I've never seen so many bones in one place in my life. What is it with this place? If you look at the mudstone right here, this stuff, it's puffy and lumpy. And that's because it has volcanic ash in it. And so the water didn't drain very well. It just made the whole floodplain really mucky and muddy. And it was easy for dinosaurs to get mired in it or get caught in it. And how come this just didn't get eroded away over the years? I mean, it's just so fragile. Uh, and it would, except for we have a, some sandstone lens on top. That's what makes the bluff, Como Bluff, is a, a cap of sandstone, really hard, heavy sandstone that kind of protects it, you know, like a, a, a crust on a pie. That's great. Just pure luck. The geology here is perfect. We've got everything that we need. So as Bill Reed says, when he discovers this place and, and contacts Marsh, it's not just that there's loads of dinosaurs, but it's accessible because it's so easy to dig through this mud. And the Transcontinental Railroad is a mile away. <laughs> and you can pack them up, put them on the train, ship them back east. Part of Marsh's team in Como Bluff was Arthur Lakes, the school teacher who'd found the Stegosaurus and the T-Rex teeth. Luckily, Lakes was not only a fossil hunter, but an enthusiastic painter too. These watercolors give us such a vivid impression of what fossil hunting in the West was like. They're eating around the campfire, got a rifle on them in case they protect themselves against wild animals or maybe the odd human. And here, this last picture, the whole point of the operation, digging big holes in landscape, a little bit like this, and finding dinosaur bones. By the end of the summer of 1878, Marsh's team had discovered nearly 30 tons of fossils. The bones belong to all kinds of new species, and they were in fantastic condition. One of those new species was the Brontosaurus, which I've got a picture of here. It was almost complete, that was missing a head, and more species were to follow. The American Wild West was really delivering. These finds were revolutionizing science. So far, Marsh's team had been digging in these rich fossil fields alone. In the spring of 1879, Edward Drinker Cope arrived here and started digging too. I want to see what this place would have looked like 150 years ago. Paleontologist Brent Breithaupt thinks there's a way. 
We are at a spot that I call the Como Bluff Overlook. This is on the eastern edge of this 10 mile long anticline. I've got a beautiful painting and the best thing is this area doesn't seem to have changed at all in the last, well, 150 years. Yeah, you've got a picture that was done in 1879. If we were standing on this ridge back in the 1870s, 1880s, we'd probably hear the chipping of the hammers on the rock. We'd probably hear, you know, the, the workers mumbling in the background. So with the dozens of quarries that were here, some of them were marshes, some of them were copes. And the fossil collectors would spy on each other to see what the other ones were finding. And even in some rare cases, bones were smashed and damaged so that the rival teams couldn't collect those. Wow. That's how much they hate each other. They hated each other vehemently. Cope and Marsh had finally found the best place in America for dinosaur fossils. In fact, they found the best place in the world. Nowhere else on Earth at the time could match what was being found here. The dinosaur discoveries in Como Bluff were groundbreaking. But an even more amazing location was about to be found and the discoveries would be astonishing. By the 1870s, the Wild West had become the greatest dinosaur gold mine in the world, shedding amazing light on the planet's prehistoric past. These incredible finds were also an opportunity to figure out the greatest puzzle of the age, Charles Darwin's famous theory of evolution. I've come to Darwin's home just outside London to find out how. In the middle of the 19th century, Down House was a hotbed of controversy. Olivia Fryman is a curator here. So this is Charles Darwin's study. This is the room where he read, experimented and wrote his many publications, including The Origin of Species. His most famous book, one of the most famous books ever written, this is a first edition copy. This is one of 1,250 copies that were printed in 1859 and that sold out immediately. The main idea in the book is that populations evolve over time through natural selection. That is the process whereby organisms that are better adapted to their environment tend to thrive, survive and reproduce more and therefore they become dominant. So rather than an outside force, God changing what animals look like and how they act, it's just, it's a natural process. Yes, it's an entirely natural process. These ideas were really, really shocking for people. They were a completely new way of looking at the world. The big problem Darwin had is it was a lot harder in Europe to prove his theory of evolution because there was not as much obvious accessible evidence. The geology was different. In Europe, great forests covered up the rocks below. And so it was hard to find dinosaur skeletons, and then the skeletons of their descendants to see how they evolved. Darwin needed as much evidence as possible, and a key piece was about to come from an unexpected source across the Atlantic. Darwin received a letter from Othniel Marsh. It told him about an amazing discovery he'd made, the remains of a large, flightless, bird-like reptile. It's got a beak, but it's also got these little reptilian teeth that you can see here. And that proved for Darwin that birds and reptiles had both evolved from the same common ancestor hundreds of millions of years ago in the time of the dinosaurs. It represented a bit of a missing link. It helped to prove his theory of evolution. The Hesperonis lived 80 million years ago. To Darwin, this creature bridged the gap between dinosaurs and modern birds because its toothed jaw had recognisable traits from both. It was essential evidence that birds today are descended from meat-eating dinosaurs. This was evolution caught in the act, like a missing piece in a puzzle. This letter was written in this house by Darwin in 1880. And he says to Marsh that he admires his work and he thinks it affords the best support of the theory of evolution which has appeared within the last 20 years. That's high praise from Darwin. Back in America, the hunt for dinosaur bones in the Wild West 
carried on throughout the 1880s, with Marsh and Cope funding large-scale expeditions. By 1890, the Bone Wars had been going on for 20 years. Just imagine that, spending 20 years obsessing about what the other person is up to. It had a terrible effect on their lives. Marsh had become a loner. Cope, for his part, had spent so long out west, his wife left, taking their daughter with her. It was a sorry state of affairs. In 1896, Cope got ill and died the following year. Marsh died two years later, in 1899. Their dinosaur gold rush had finally come to an end. Between them, they discovered over 130 new species of dinosaur. Incredible. They'd shone a light on a previously unknown age in our planet's history. At the time, they were towering figures of science, the two most famous paleontologists in the world. Before Marsh and Cope, there were only nine named species of dinosaur in North America, and very little was known about them. The two of them added 136 more species. Among them are some of the most well-known dinosaurs today. Triceratops, Diplodocus, Stegosaurus, Camarasaurus, but also many others. The Allosaurus was a gigantic meat-eating dinosaur that lived around 150 million years ago during the Jurassic Age and was one of the first carnivore dinosaurs to be discovered. It turned out to be the most abundant large predator in the prehistoric Wild West. Another giant to be discovered was the Brontosaurus, a massive 70-foot creature that lived in the Jurassic Age and mysteriously died out around 145 million years ago. It had a long, thin neck and a small head adapted for a herbivore lifestyle. Their many finds defined the field of paleontology and revealed a secret prehistoric world that was filled with gigantic animals. But there was one thing they hadn't quite managed to achieve. Find a complete dinosaur and put it together for the wider public. Marsh was closest to achieving this. His team found a good brontosaurus skeleton, but it was missing a head. Luckily, one man kept on digging. By the 1890s, William Reed was employed by the University of Wyoming as a fossil hunter. One day in 1896, he was walking through his old stomping grounds here at Como Bluff, and he saw something that he couldn't quite believe. Amongst the sandstone, he saw a truly gigantic thigh bone. Like in the days of the Bone Wars, Reed wanted to sell the find to make a profit. But Marsh and Cope weren't around anymore, so he needed to get the attention of another buyer. He thought a bit of publicity might help. Matt Lamana can tell me more. This is an article that appeared in the New York Journal and Advertiser in December 1898, uh, describing a discovery that had just been made by Bill Reed in Wyoming. And it's very over the top. It's got yeah, the got, best headline I've yeah, ever read in yeah, my life. Most colossal animal ever on earth just found out west. But my favorite is actually not the headline itself, but the subtitles, such as when it ate, it filled the stomach large enough to hold three elephants. And is this the man, this is the, the man who discovered it? Yeah, here. that's that's him. That's William Harlow Reed, Bill Reed, shown with what is claimed to be the eight foot thigh bone of the monster discovered in Wyoming. This article was not the only one that appeared about this discovery. In fact, an earlier article, maybe not quite as dramatic as this one, uh, was noticed by somebody really powerful. This scrawl here, can you read that? Yep. It says, my Lord, can't you buy this for Pittsburgh? Try, and at the end it's signed AC, Andrew Carnegie. So Carnegie's famous being one of the richest men in the world. He's a big steel magnate in Pittsburgh. Why is he so interested in dinosaurs? He had a brand new museum. He wanted something that was going to get people to come. He wanted a gift for the people of Pittsburgh, basically, something to put their museum on the map. So yeah, it's amazing to think 
Here's Bill Reed working out there, getting all dusty on the front line, and he's got this weird pipeline now into one of the world's richest men sitting in his Fifth Avenue apartment. It seems like something that you would see in a movie, but as Carnegie would find out, it wasn't just as simple as going to Wyoming and bringing the giant dinosaur home. The massive bone that Bill Reed found is currently at the Carnegie Museum of Natural History. This is the upper end of a left thigh bone and that inspired the newspaper article. So don't get me wrong, that's a great bit of bone, but that's, that's not the bone in the photo of the article. No, no, and it would have belonged to a very big dinosaur. That being said, you know, the size of the dinosaur in the newspaper article was pretty ridiculously exaggerated. You know, Andrew Carnegie, very rich guy, not a paleontologist, and so when he saw that article, he, he bought it. So Carnegie sort of fell for the clickbait there a little bit. I would say so, news. yeah, I would say so. To make matters worse, this piece of bone was the only thing Bill Reed had found, not an entire dinosaur. Andrew Carnegie would need to go on his own hunt out in the Wild West, and that's exactly what he did. He was about to set in motion the discovery of the most famous dinosaur ever found. The Como Bluff area in Wyoming once the site of some of the greatest dinosaur discoveries ever made, now attracted the attention of a man with bottomless pockets. Steel tycoon Andrew Carnegie, one of the richest men in the world, desperately wanted a dinosaur for his new museum in Pittsburgh. Although Bill Reed had found a huge bone, he didn't actually have the rest of the dinosaur to go with it. That didn't stop him, though, from promising it to Carnegie and his team. All he needed, he said, was a load of cash to dig it up. In 1899, Carnegie bit the bullet and sent a team out west to look for dinosaurs at the site. But instead of a huge prehistoric giant, they found nothing. Bill Reed had to come up with a backup plan quickly. And somehow, he had a hunch that another spot, a very remote place few people knew about, might offer a solution. Paleontologist Brent Breitharp can take me there. But even today, it's not easy to find. So we're navigating based on a photograph taken in 1899. This is a photo of the quarry workers, but what we're interested in is a skyline here. We're looking for these outcrops way off in the distance. Yeah, you haven't got too much to go on, I'd say. No, not too much. Last time I was here was about 15 years ago. I remember most of the way to go, but there's a couple turns up ahead that may be challenging, but I'm sure we can do it. I have great faith in you. I, as well you should. <laughs> <laughs> After two long hours of driving through open landscape, Brent finds the spot. This is Sheep's Creek. So that was not an easy journey to get here. Very few people have ever come out here. And so the roads that we were following were barely roads. Carnegie's team started digging at this remote spot. The months rolled on. Spring came and went, still no finds. In early July, it had been three months of disconsolate digging and nothing to show for it. As summer approached, the air became hot and filled with flies. The strong wind carried dust and tumbleweed. Worst of all, the temperature soared. Carnegie's team kept going. They didn't give up despite the harsh climate, the heat, the wind, the thunderstorms. They kept digging. By the 4th of July, Independence Day, they were really under pressure to make a find. Incredibly, the intense digging activity here has left many clues behind. Even today, a trained eye can still spot them. 
there's little bits and pieces of where the early collectors were working. Here we have an old can. There's really been no activity out here since the late 1800s, early 1900s. So anything we find relates to the fossil collecting. Can't believe it, from the original dig team, you think? The original dig team, yeah, from the Carnegie crew. If you keep looking around, lots of rocks, but this one here, a little fragment of bone. Get out of here. Take a look at that. You can see the little pore spaces of the bone. This appears to be a rib bone, no. and I'll bet that it's a rib bone of a diplodocus. It's, it's That is very cool. On the 4th of July, 1899, the moment Carnegie's crew had been waiting for finally arrived. It was on that day that one of the workers struck something with his spade. He called over his friends and dug down deeper. Under his feet, he'd unearthed a massive toe bone. Over the coming days and months, the team uncovered an incredible find. Bit by bit, an almost complete diplodocus was taken out of the ground here. Over two thirds of the bones were found intact in great condition, not broken up into small pieces. Excitingly, a second diplodocus was also found here, probably related to the first. They'd lived together, traveled together, and died together. And that meant that whatever was lacking from the first skeleton could be filled in from the second. So the fusion of the two created one of the world's most complete dinosaurs and the world's most famous dinosaur, Dippy. The massive bones the crew recovered were sent 1,500 miles away to Pittsburgh to Carnegie's brand new Museum of Natural History. I'm heading there to see the original Dippy. These are the actual bones taken out of the ground in Wyoming. The most complete diplodocus ever found. The pinnacle of 30 years of dinosaur hunting in the Wild West. Because of the date on which it was discovered, the 4th of July, it was known as the Star Spangled Dinosaur. All of a sudden, dinosaurs were very, very real. They weren't in books or illustrations or half cobbled together models. You could now put them on display and have people come to marvel at them. Dippy's discovery caused a stir, not just in the United States, but worldwide. So still, there are still crowds of people who have come to see Dippy. Why is this such a famous dinosaur? So in 1902, Andrew Carnegie was hosting the King of England in Carnegie's castle in Scotland. And the King saw a, a, a picture of Diplodocus Carnegie on, on Carnegie's wall and said, can we have one of these things for England? And in May of 1905, a copy of Diplodocus Carnegie went on display in London's British Museum of Natural History, now the Natural History Museum in London. The fame of Diplodocus spread from there. So other heads of state started asking Andrew Carnegie for copies of Diplodocus for their own museum. By the mid-1930s, there were copies in London, Paris, Berlin, Madrid, Vienna, Bologna, St. Petersburg, La Plata in Argentina, Mexico City, and a copy was sent to Munich. I remember being in a foreign European city, seeing it and going, what the heck is this British dinosaur yeah. doing here? <laughs> the it. truth yeah. has been a bit difficult to yeah, digest. Yeah. Yeah. When you think about how many people have seen those copies of Diplodocus, this dinosaur is probably the most seen dinosaur in the history of the planet, and that contributed to its fame. It was, in a lot of ways, a humanity's first window into what a truly giant dinosaur would have been like. If you're a person off the street seeing one of these things for the first time, your mind is probably blown. How can a land animal be this big? And they look so different from what we're used to seeing, animals that we see in the modern world. Getting away from all the kings and princes and emperors, we still think Dippy is important today though, right? Oh yeah, it's, it's hugely important from a scientific standpoint. Its discovery was a watershed moment in the history of paleontology because this was science's first 
relatively complete view into what the largest dinosaurs were like. What started as two men fighting over fossils in the Wild West became an international craze to unlock the secrets of the prehistoric world and its gigantic animals. And it continues to this day. It's incredible to think that without the bone walls and the intrepid adventurers coming out here to the west, we may not know about Stegosaurus, T-Rex, or even Dippy. These breathtaking discoveries were revolutionary. They inspired new generations of explorers into the Badlands, who in turn would discover new species of dinosaurs that would transform the way we understand life on Earth. And what I find so inspiring is the story is not yet over. So who knows what mysterious creatures lie waiting to be discovered in this vast wilderness. It's a very special Inside the Tower of London tomorrow. Don't miss that, new at eight. Brand new next Wednesday at nine, home to Britain's most notorious criminals, we venture into high security HMP Full Sutton in evil behind bars. Coming up, the critical care team race to free a motorist trapped after crashing head-on with a tractor. Ambulance Code Red is next. <laughs>